to our 15th annual gala for CARE Chicago. And I begin by asking the same question to this audience here. Should race and or religion determine your rights and privileges in this country? That is the question before us today. That has been the question before us throughout many episodes of the history of the United States of America. And it has been answered yes by far too many people. And now is the time for more people to join us, not just in words, but in action, answering no and putting forward a different vision of what this country ought to look like. And that is a country, as Martin Luther King said, that judges its children by the content of their character, that understands that the merit of being a human, of being a citizen, of being a dreamer, of being someone that can build and construct, someone who can solve, someone who can unite with others, is what makes America special, if America is ever special at all. <clears throat> it is also important to understand that since day one, that question was hanging over us. Times today are tough. But times are also promising. We just elected here in the great state of Illinois our first Mexican-American congressman, the great Chuy Garcia. And mind you, that is not a fact worthy of mention just because that he is Mexican-American, but because he's someone that once upon a time being who he is today, intelligent, capable, with a vision, would have not imagined that he could be elected. But he's broken that glass ceiling, and others have before him, and others will after him. In the same Congress, we saw the election of the first Muslim American Congresswoman, the first Palestinian American Congresswoman, our sister Rashida Blake, who is tonight. Since 1776, we haven't had an American Muslim Congresswoman, and suddenly in 2019, we have two. Not to forget, Ilhan Omar, who as another first in that same session of the So times are tough, but times are promising. More and more Americans who once upon a time were told, you gotta sit it out. You have to sit in the bleachers and watch the rest of us run this place. You don't have a place at the table. You're a little too dark. Your religion is a little too different. You're the wrong gender. You're the wrong national background. That is being cha challenged today, not just in words, but by people running for office, by people voting at the polls, by people building institutions or maintaining institutions like this that provide a backbone for communities that are attacked in order to be erased or marginalized or demonized. Organizations like Care Chicago. But to go back to our first day of America, and even before that, the Declaration of Independence, even then, it was a promising document, but one with challenges. There was the promise of a people yearning for justice. Who's read the Declaration of Independence? Did you realize that in essence, the Declaration of Independence is nothing but a litany of grievances against social injustice. At its very heart, that's what it is. People say we're done being second-class citizens. We're done being taxed without representation. We're done being thieved by corrupt, individuals who don't connect with us and our families, who don't care about our future, who see us as a bag of money or an opportunity to exploit, who don't make us feel safe, who don't make us feel like we're in control of our own lives. They were then the vanquished, vulnerable minority. And that was a legitimate cry for justice. But at the same time, that this legitimate cry that included then an alternative vision for freedom, 
and for self-governance. At that very same moment, at the very same time, there was one problem. There was a challenge. And that, that this dream, this vision, didn't extend to everybody. Because at that same moment, African Americans were in chains. At that same moment, Native Americans were being hunted down like wild animals and wiped out in the genocide. At that same moment that we talked about all men were created equal, we saw people as less than equal and either killed them or put them in chains. And so the dream was there and it didn't extend to everybody. So there was the promise, but there was the challenge. And since that day till today, it's always been a quibble, a fight, a conflict between two sides in America. But let's be clear about the two sides. It's not white versus black. It's not Christian versus Muslim. What it is, are those who believe that the tent should remain ever narrow, the tent of promise. And those who believe that that tent should keep widening until it includes everybody who lives in this country or walks on its soil. That is where the line is drawn in the sand. And anybody who tells you otherwise is not just fooling us, but fooling themselves and wasting everybody's time. So all of these battles out there in the media, on Main Street, in Washington, about Muslims being the threat, no. The threat of those in America who don't understand that to widen the tent is to make America better, stronger, more effective, more efficient, more closer to its own promise and its own ideals. Because ideals are just ideals. They become fact when you work to implement them for everybody. My friends, I don't want to just be oratorical or rhetorical with you today. I want to get down to something very concrete. We know what the challenges are. We know, if I may summarize them, that ultimately it is about power and privilege. It is about bullying. And that's the story of humankind, it's not just the story of America. That often those who build a certain amount of power or believe that they have a certain amount of privilege, they try to keep others out. And so there's exploitation, and there's the feeling of we can get away with this. The strong knocking on the weak. It's not just the story of America. Look, anywhere in the world, throughout history, in many countries today, it's the same thing. It's that, that's the same basic problem. Now, it may take religious colors, it may take racial colors, it may take political, ideological colors, social, you know, constructs and ideas and philosophies, but ultimately it's about the powerful versus the powerless. Those who want to maintain a small tent and those who want to widen it. And those who believe that they have the power and the privilege sometimes think that there's nothing to be paid, no price to be paid by stomping on those who don't. That is the mentality of a little schoolyard child bullying another. He believes he has certain power. I'm smarter. Maybe I'm stronger. I'm better looking. I'm cooler. Whatever that power is, whatever that power is, in their mind, I'm better. And that person is less than me. And then, associated with that idea, is the notion that I can do what I want to that person and get away with it. It's the same thing when you extrapolate that little microcosm of an example in the schoolyard to an adult, a bunch of adults, a government, who's now, in that same mentality, bullying a minority, or bullying a group of people. And it could be for any reason. Again, they're out of favor for their religion, for their color, for their race, for their political beliefs, for their social beliefs. And to then persecute in various ways, from subtle discrimination all the way to full-blown persecution. Still, we're still talking about the same basic dynamic. It happens in America, it happens in the Middle East, it happens in Asia, in Europe, in Africa. And it's the same basic problem. And so what do you do? How do you deal with bullying? Well, this is why we're here. This is why I'm here. This is why I got here in the first place, because I was bullied when I was in high school. Well, at least they tried. 
It was an attempt. It didn't go very far. But often it can. I try to talk tough. There's nothing wrong if someone who feels that they can't stand up to bully on their own. There's something wrong, though, if we can't provide a system for someone who feels bullied to feel like they're not alone and have a back. And this is what this is about. This is about anti-bullying. This is about standing up to bullies. When, when someone out there sees what they think is a foreign-looking person in a hijab and a niqab, and by the way, we serve a religious community, we're not a religious organization, so if someone walks into my office, I'm not having a debate about, but this Islam doesn't really say you have to wear the niqab, sister. Why do you go all the way with the niqab? The hijab is sufficient. I'll leave those debates for those who like those debates. For me, the fact is this. As a Muslim woman, you can believe that the hijab is necessary or not, the niqab is necessary or not. That's your choice. And once you've made that choice of belief of conscience, you're entitled to live it out without harassment or persecution. That's what a civil rights organization thinks about. So I just want to make that clear for the few, and sometimes I read minds, who look at this and think, come on, man, of all the cases in the world, it's not a good look. Well, do we really want to get to a point where we look at women and then look at the cloth, and that's a good look or not the right look? Have you seen her heart? Do you know this person? Because I got to know her, a wonderful, beautiful person. And she's entitled to walk down the street and not be looked at as an animal. As a matter of fact, I want a case like this. I want someone who's probably the least preferred visual, and then to be able to say, you're still welcome, you're still a human, and you're still entitled to your basic human rights and human dignity. Because that's what Muslims stand for, but that's also what I believe America stands for. So there she is walking down the street, and somebody looks at her and thinks she's not worth it, she's not worthwhile. Big deal if I attack her, big deal if I punch her in the face, big deal if I yank that thing off her head. Big deal she could turn out to be a terrorist at the end. So what? It's the same thing when somebody's at McDonald's, we have those cases, and it's not a big law, it's just a hijab. Some kid, 18-year-old, yanks it off to show off to his friends, big deal. The many cases of actual bullying in the schoolyard that we have, big deal. Corporations that fire people because of their religious background or refuse to hire them, Big deal. Housing authorities that deny them housing. Airports that pick them out randomly, quote unquote, from a line. Big deal. The father of a, and the founder of the patriarch of a major sports franchise in America, sharing silly, stupid, ignorant emails about Islamic Muslims and they get leaked. Big deal. At least it was in the beginning. I think that's been made clear that it is a big deal by now. We'll get into that. The point is this unless we do two things to confront a bully, this will continue. One is to be able to identify bullying when bullying happens and call it by its name. And two is to be able to build the system an operation that systematically stands up for those who are bullied, those who are most vulnerable, those who others think are not worth it, and to be their backbone. And we can't do this as individuals. We can only do this as institutions and organizations. I use these terms, but what I really mean to say, as an organized body of people. Now that could be a voting, body of people, to put in the right people in government, to fight bullying in government, and that's why voting is so important. But that can also be a community building a civil rights organization to ensure that you have a watchdog and you have an organization that can fight back, push back when necessary, in order to bring justice to the most vulnerable and the least popular, who deserves justice by the mere virtue of them being human. Not even being Muslim. And I remind everybody here that in our faith, your right to dignity doesn't come upon your conversion into Islam, but upon your first breath as a human being, because as a human, you 
you've been afforded dignity by your maker, regardless of what faith you are. That is what keeps us up at night. That is what brings us into our office every day. That is what makes us try to grow and strengthen and sustain this effort and have events like this to ask you to do the same. So that these many cases, I mentioned one, but there are exactly 5,500 today. It's a big number of cases. All free of charge. We've never charged our clients. You guys help us provide this free service to these people who can't afford to find justice otherwise. And I can't spend enough time, I only have a few minutes left. Uh, even if I could, I would never be able to convey to you the human component in each case. What it means to someone who felt that they were less, who almost believed that they were less, who almost settled for being less, being vanquished, and suddenly felt human again, alive again. The justice has been achieved. They can put, raise their head up high, walk down the street, or into their office, or into their school, or into a CTA station, and not feel like they can be bum rushed and put to the ground and shoved and, and stripped. That they have rights. Only an organization that does this every day. Times have changed. Now people that can do media. When we started this work, I remember. It was trailblazing work to a degree 15 years ago. Because I remember a lot of people telling me, don't go on Fox News. Muslims don't do that. I said, why? Well, he said, because they're just going to attack you, they're going to lower your mic and make you look bad. I said, well, that's a pretty low bar. I'd rather do that than go somewhere where I'm expected to do good. But really, what, why I wanted to do it was to remind us and discover for myself whether it's even possible that our voice belongs at every table and we control our own messaging. Nobody can control our own messaging. We bring the messaging to the table. All right? If you hear the first word, well, we got the second one. And if you want to take the first push, well, we got the second one. Preferably speaking, of course. But we belong everywhere. There's nowhere we should be where we should be off limits. And today, 15 years later, it's not just here in Chicago that's in the news regularly. We've seen a lot of young people, a lot of older people, a lot of activists, individuals who have made a career of being wonderful spokespersons for different causes, eloquent representatives of different causes. Sometimes they don't belong to any organizations. It's a community coming of age. And we have people that can stand up for social injustice. We have social media blowing up with activists. We don't have a monopoly on the ability to connect with the media, carry a story, work for a social justice cause or case. We don't have a monopoly on that. But here's what we do have. The ability to be systematic. Because if we leave it to individuals, if I quit this job and go back into the corporate world from where I came, what's going to happen is when something fancies my interest, then I'll start to talk about it. When I have time, then I'll start to do something about it. But when we build an organization that we know is committed full time so that even when your eye is off the ball, my eye and my team's eye is going to remain on the ball on your behalf. That's what an organization does. That's what a watchdog is. That is what systemic civil rights work is. It's every day. It's dedicated. It's full time. And we look for things. We have a research department. We don't even wait for things to hit us in the face. We don't wait for things to be headline news. We don't wait for things to get go viral. We hit it, and we hit it for the long term. This story with Angel, the Maccabi that was harassed and beaten with strip, I'll give you that as an example. Huge reaction on social media for about two, three days when the story broke out. Now, if you want to keep social justice for that sort of thing, this story would have died three years ago, you'd never hear about it again. But after that noise, which was legitimate and important, we need to continue to talk about these things. But naturally, people are going to go back to their lives. What's that happened for the last three years on a regular basis? This team at Care Chicago has been meeting with her, 
and going through all of the details, the excruciating details of working on a case, depositions, court filings, court, court appearances, negotiations, you know, copying things, faxing things, meeting with people, interviewing people, researching cases, researching facts of the case, so on and so forth. And not just that, when we have a client like this, we work with her, not just as a client, but as a human. So she had issues with immigration, not related to the abuses that she faced. We helped her with that. A lot of hours spent on that, because as a human, she's hurting, and that is related to what happened. She can't focus on taking care of her other issues. Issues in school, we helped with that. I spent a lot of time translating because I felt that just a, you know, hiring a translator wasn't able to convey the passion that she had inside, and I understood what she went through. So I became her translator many, many a time. When we take a case, what I need to say is we take a human, and that's what you expect from us. We're a wolf. This isn't Karen's show. This isn't my show. This is the State of the Union on civil rights in the community back to those who've invested and given us the mandate to say, go out there, represent us, and make sure nobody out there who's a bigot, who's a racist, who's someone who's insightful, that nobody can get away with injustice against any of our sons and daughters. That's what this is about. We had a great meeting with the Cubs organization chairman just yesterday. Of all the days of the year, of course, it had to be, all, all this mess had to be the week before the banquet. It's very difficult for us. But we had great partners. CIGC, the Illinois Most Civic Coalition, and congratulations to CIGC on their new chairman, Rashad Khan. Rashad, and Laura, and Gregory, and Mitchell. We all came together and we met with them. And there was a lot of preparation. This is I'll close with this, but this is a great sort of anecdote because it shows what can happen when the entire community has come of age and works together in various facets to move a file along. We connected with super fans, including the president of the MCC, Kamran Hussein, who happens to be an ophthalmologist, but also a season ticket holder and someone who breathes the cups. Right? So at this point, it's not just about Ahmed, you know, the bulldog that fights about Islamophobia. I need the field expertise, the subject matter expertise in this story. A father Rain, many of you didn't know he was involved, but the beauty of this community, some people behind the scenes are doing more than some that you see. This guy, incredible. Long conversation, great advice. Long story short, we met. And I sent a summary yesterday, but the point I want to make here is, he began by saying that my dad is not ignorant. The man who made the comment. Patriarch, the older Ricketts. And at that point, I said, You know, you're right. His dog, he has a very high level of education. He's done better with money than I could ever dream of doing. Clearly, he's a smart man. Clearly, he can't be an ignorant man. But you know what? He fits the profile of many a person who says the kind of thing he says, who spews the kind of things that he spews. Because we need to get to a point where we can understand that bigotry and Islamophobia and racism is not for somebody who didn't go, didn't finish high school. Some of the worst are Ivy League graduates. Some of the worst are people who are very powerful, very capable, who've traveled the world, who've seen things, but still, back to the initial, initial point of the power dynamic of the privilege, don't see the rest of us as worth it. But I can get away with this. Now, I don't want to leave you the impression that this is where we ended, this is where we started. Where we ended was a very good place. Tom, I have to say, is a genuine good guy. He understood what we were saying. That together, we're going to move forward to shift what once could have been the sports franchise that is associated with Islamophobia to the model sports franchise that will be associated anti-Islamophobia through initiatives that are public, meaningful, genuine, and visible. And that's what we're doing together. And that's how you change the track. You talk. Sometimes you push, you have a rough press conference. It's part of it. Other times you extend a hand and you have a conversation. That's what you do in Congress, Congresswoman. That's what you do in Congress, Congresswoman. So I'll close by saying that let's pull up our sleeves. Let's not put our heads down. 
Let's understand the purpose for the long run. That we can make change, we will have setbacks, but ultimately things are changing for the better. Your children are probably more socially and civically astute than their parents. Their children will be more than them. As we grow as a community, as we build, we're going to have more opportunities. That's not in question. What's in question is, will we now set the table the right way? Will we now give a head start and ensure that those who are among, among the most vulnerable amongst us today have a back, have a back home? Thank you very much. Imam Sheikh Hassan Mustafa Ali, who is the Imam and Director of Religious Affairs at the Mecca Center in Willowbrook, a beautiful masjid out there, great community, is a graduate of the prestigious Al Azhar University of Cairo in Egypt, and he has the Senate linked to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Quran and Hadith. He has held the position of Imam and served as a Director of Religious Affairs uh, in many Islamic centers. He's also the author of many articles published in newspapers and websites. Is currently pursuing a PhD as well as teaching as an adjunct professor. I don't know where you find the time for all of these things, you know. But